During his ministry on earth, Jesus was bitterly attacked by those who hated him. It was kind of part and parcel of his experience, being attacked. And in the attacks against Jesus, no area was off limits and no time was ever inconvenient for the Pharisees and others to oppose and criticize him on various issues. It was gloves off all the time. Now in Mark chapter two, Mark describes a rather intense attack upon Jesus, which saw his accusers question him regarding his character as well as his teaching. So we're going to review these attacks here and see not only how Jesus handled these people who were attacking him, but also see what these attacks managed to reveal about Jesus himself, because you kind of see the man through the attacks and how he responded. You know, the beauty of Christ is that he not only received the insults of his enemies, but he managed to use these occasions to glorify himself as the Son of God through these negative criticisms and attacks made against him. So the attacks against the Lord took various forms. In Mark chapter two, the gospel writer lists four separate attacks questioning Jesus' credibility. So first of all, they attacked his authority. So let's read Mark chapter two, beginning in verse one. Mark writes, when he had come back to Capernaum several days afterward, it was heard that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no longer room, not even near the door, and he was speaking the word to them. And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. Being unable to get him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him, and when they had dug an opening, they let down the pallet upon which the paralytic was lying. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why does this man speak that way? He is blaspheming, who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves, said to them, why are you reasoning about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and pick up your pallet and walk? But so you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet and go home. And he got up and immediately picked up the pallet and went out the sight of everyone, so that they were all amazed and were glorifying God saying, we have never seen anything like this. Now in this scene, Jesus has returned home after a very dynamic series of healing ministries in Galilee, his home region. He's healed the masses, people knew who he was and his fame was spread throughout the country. But now you have to kind of you know, see it between the lines. Now he comes back to his town, Capernaum, and you've got the hometown crowd and also the local clergymen are there. Now had Jesus healed the paralytic right away, the meaning of what he had done would have been lost in the wonder of the miracle. People would have just said, wow, you know, if he would have just said, you're healed, that's it. People would have been knocked back. Wow, it's really true, he can do miracles. But miracles were done as signs that pointed to something else. In other words, they were not just done for themselves. They weren't done simply to wow people or to make them excited. They were done to point to something specific. As a matter of fact, they were called signs and wonders in other passages, Mark 16, 20, for example. Now the miracles that Jesus did were done to point to His authority, and His authority was necessary to accomplish His main task, and that was the forgiving or the removal of sins from men. He would ultimately do this through His uh, crucifixion and resurrection. So in this case, when the, when the scribes questioned his authority in forgiving sins, 
you know, they were really on the right track here. They were really thinking in a proper way. They understood that in order to forgive sins, one must have authority. The kind of authority that only God possesses. What they refused to accept was that Jesus had this kind of authority. Now in doing the miracle after forgiving the man, Jesus demonstrated the kind of power that only God could possess. He had the power to heal in a miraculous way. Only God had that kind of power. And so in this first episode, the people who witnessed the words and the miracle understood Jesus' authority to forgive was based on His power, and His power was demonstrated through the miracle. In other words, if He had the power to heal, therefore He also had the power to forgive. So the first thing that they were challenging, we, we see it in their minds, and He could read their minds, they were challenging His authority. Who are you, they were saying, to say to this man, your sins are forgiven. And even after the miracle was performed to prove that He had that authority, they still, they still didn't give Him credit for it. Another place where they challenged Him, as we continue the story, they challenged His purity. Imagine challenging the purity of the Son of God. Chapter two, let's keep reading in verse 15 this time. Just go down a little bit there. It says, and it happened that he was reclining at the table in his house, and many tax collectors and sinners were dining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many of them, and they were following him. When the scribes and the Pharisees saw that he was eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they said to his disciples, why is he eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners? And hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, I came to call the sinners. So once again, Jesus is in His own home. He lived in Capernaum. And the passage suggests that the men who were sitting down, you know, that they had you know, previously you know, let down through the roof, that was also in His house. So there was a lot of things going on at His house. He's eating in this scene. He's welcoming into his home, well, what they would call the riffraff of that particular society. Those who were considered sinners for various reasons. And believe it or not, you were considered sinners, and you know, it was a pretty broad term, the way it is used here. You know, if you were uneducated, or if you were unfaithful, or if you were unwanted because of your behavior, all of this was grouped into Sinners, you know, just the riffraff, the bottom layer, you know, people you don't really want to associate with, as well as the tax collectors. I mean, those who collected the, uh, the taxes for Rome uh, among their own people, they were the lowest of the low. And yet all these people were in his house. So their objection to him was that he was becoming uh, ceremoniously impure. In other words, by, by, by being in contact with this riffraff, he was becoming ceremonially uh, unpure, impure. In other words, unable to enter and worship at the temple because of contact with sinners, with common people. Now the real attack was that he himself was impure and sinful like the people that he associated with. That was the unmeant, you know, that was the, the unspoken uh, attack here in this scene. Of course, you notice that the passage said several things about his association with these people. For example, these people were there along with his disciples, suggesting that his disciples were the ones that were bringing these people to Jesus in an effort to save them. Another thing, he was eating with them, but there was no suggestion of a party or any type of revelry. You know, Mark is not saying you know, he was partying with the sinners. It just says the sinners were in his home and, and they, were, uh, you know, they were eating with him. He had welcomed them uh, to his home. In other words, he wasn't sharing their sinful habits. They were sharing his meal along with his disciples. The one who was doing the influencing was him, not them. And then also these people were following him meaning that they were receiving instructions from Jesus like the other disciples received. 
You know, the Lord did not make any distinctions based on education or wealth or background. Those who wanted to follow Him and follow Him faithfully were permitted to do so. And so in His response in verse 17, Jesus demonstrated that His purity did not rest upon meticulous keeping of ceremonial washings and religious traditions. His purity was based on His compassion. I repeat that, His purity was based on His compassion. His association with sinners didn't make Him dirty, it made them cleaner. You know the argument, some people say, well I hang around with those guys, you know, and so on and so forth. You know, Jesus was with the sinners. Some people use that as an excuse you know, to kind of have associations, to partake in worldly activities because they're saying, hey, you know, Jesus hung out with the sinners, I hang out with the sinners. But you, you have to remember that Jesus was the one doing the influencing. He was influencing the sinners. It wasn't going the other way. A third thing that they attacked him uh, about was his dedication. So let's keep reading. Verse 18, all in the same passage. It says, John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting and they came and they said to him, why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, while the bridegroom is with them, the attendants of the bridegroom cannot fast, can they? So long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them and then they will fast in that day. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, otherwise the patch pulls away from it and the new from the old and a worse tear results. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, otherwise the wine will burst the skins and the wine is lost and the skins as well. But one puts new wine into fresh wineskins. So here the attack is directed toward Jesus' disciples, but the inference is that it's also directed towards, towards Him. Now this business of fasting here that is mentioned, you know, the Pharisees' disciples, they said they fast, and John's disciples, they fast, and the accusation was, who, well, who do you think you are? Your disciples, they don't fast. What's wrong with that? Aren't you as devoted as John or as the Pharisees? Now the deduction, of course, is that since your disciples' zeal is less than these, then you also must be less in stature than these. Your devotion and your dedication was, is probably less than that of John or that of the Pharisees. Of course, the reason the Pharisees' disciples fasted is because this was a religious law imposed upon them by the Pharisees. And the reason that John's disciples fasted was because John had been arrested and he was in prison. And so they prayed and they fasted for his condition and his release, hopefully. Now Jesus' disciples were not asked to fast by Jesus. And since he was with them, they rejoiced in his presence. There was no need to fast. The Lord tells them, however, that they too will fast one day when he too will be taken away. Of course, that was a reference to his uh, pending uh, uh, suffering and death on the cross. Now the idea of the verse, you know, about the patch and the wineskin, this is Jesus referring to their condition, the ones who are accusing him. He's talking about them here when he's talking about the, the cloth and the, and the wineskin. He doesn't reveal to them the details of his death and his resurrection because they could not accept it, because they, they couldn't believe. He only, he only referred to it obliquely, but he didn't give them the details that one day I'm going to die and resurrect and for the sins of man. He didn't bother telling the ones attacking him about the details of his upcoming passion. They, they didn't believe it. They couldn't accept it. He was the new patch and they were the old cloth and he was the new wine and they, in their disbelief, they were the old wineskin. That's why he didn't, you know, give them the information of the gospel and of his tremendous sacrifice that was coming in the near future. They indirectly questioned his dedication and although they didn't see it right away, they would eventually see his total dedication and zeal for God and man by dying on the cross for all sinners, 
including them. Imagine, the ones that had accused him of not being dedicated enough, he was going to give his life up for them. He was, in fact, preparing to give up his life for them, for them and they were in the process of attacking him. All right, one other attack here in this passage, and that's where they attacked his conduct. Again, let's go down to verse 23. It says, and it happened that he was passing through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples began to make their way along uh, while picking the heads of grain. The Pharisees were saying to him, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, have you never read what David did when he was in need? And he, was, uh, uh, he and his companions became hungry? How he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar the high priest and ate the consecrated bread which is not lawful for anyone to eat except the priests and he also gave it to those who were with him? Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Once again, the accusation is made through an attack on his disciples, you know, kind of deflected shot. They attack his disciples hoping that it'll you know, deflect on him. The charge was that of working on the Sabbath. Now, the Jews were not to harvest or work on the Sabbath day. In this case, Jesus' disciples picked off some of the heads of grain to eat while they were on their way, while they were walking, which, by the way, was lawful. You could eat what you picked as you went through, but you couldn't carry anything out with you. It's like at the buffet line at the, you know, uh, what's the place to help me here? What is it? Golden Corral, yeah, you know? You, 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 you can go around and pick food, you know, uh, and eat all you want, but you can't, you can't walk out with a box of it. What's the same thing? The law said if you went through a field, if you picked fruit or whatever, you could eat it on your way, but you couldn't take to, to carry out with you, all right? Now, the Pharisees, they saw what they were doing and they accused them, and indirectly were accusing Jesus, of improper conduct, meaning sin, in regards to the law. In answering them, Jesus gives the example of David and his men eating the showbread. The showbread was the 12 loaves kept in the holy place and only eaten by the priests. Now, he didn't do this out of disrespect, but out of need. They were on the run from Saul the king and they had no other food available to them. Now this example and the verse saying that the Sabbath being made for man and not man made for the Sabbath explained to his enemies who were hung up on external and, and ceremonial religion that outward ceremony was created to serve inward man, not the other way around. In other words, the elements of religion are there to point to spiritual realities, but they are not in themselves the realities. Do you understand what I'm saying? For example, the showbread was a reminder that all of the earth's produce belonged to the Lord. Not just these 12 loaves. These 12 loaves simply represented the produce of what the creation made and they were there simply to point to a, a greater reality, if you wish. Well, in the same way, the Sabbath was a reminder that one day there would be a total rest and peace for man to enjoy with God. Not just one day a week, the one day a week Sabbath that they were celebrating simply pointed to a greater reality, a greater spiritual reality but many of them kind of lost sight of this greater spiritual reality. They were so focused on the day and all the rules that went around it, they, they forgot the big picture. So by eating the grain, by healing, and by doing God's work on the Sabbath, Jesus showed them that it was not the elements that are sacred, it was the idea that they represented that were sacred. I'll say that again, I put the inflection on the wrong word. <laughs> Rewind, Hal, you'll have to edit this uh, film here. Let me do that again, okay? By eating the grain, by healing, and by doing God's work on the Sabbath, Jesus showed them that it was not the elements that are sacred, it's the ideas that they represented that are sacred and to be served. You know the, 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 the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine that we take on Sunday you know, for communion? 
It isn't those things that are sacred. They're just what they are. It's what they represent that is sacred, the body and the blood of Christ. So when we, for example, get all hung up about one cup, six cups, nine cups, this bread, should we break it? Should, all, should it all be broken ahead of time? Whatever, you know? And, and should it be in a silver? Should we, have, should we have a prayer before and after and during? We get hung up on the elements. The elements are simply pointing to a greater reality. We have to keep things in perspective here. Surely, to do our spiritual exercises in a decent and an orderly fashion is important, but we mustn't, you know, we mustn't forget that these things are pointing to spiritual realities that are greater than the physical elements that are in front of us. You know, we fall into this trap when we fuss over even how we serve communion. Some, some, I've seen some churches, you know, they argue over the idea of you know, Sunday evening, like here we're going to serve communion in the back room for those who did not have an opportunity to do it. But you know, some other churches that I've, I've been in, even worked at, well, you know, for a Sunday evening, everybody stays in the auditorium and whoever wants to have communion, they raise their hand and they serve it there. And if you want to have it again and share communion with those brethren, you know, well, you can do that too. Are we going to split over that? Are we going to start a fist fight over that because we do it one way and they do it another way? We're forgetting the bigger picture here. And so Jesus' enemies were accusing him of not respecting the law because he disregarded, watch it, he disregarded their traditions and their rules about how to handle the elements of religion, because that's all they did. They fussed and fought over the elements of religion, and they condemned him because he didn't follow their man-made rules. Jesus' proper use of the elements showed them that he knew the difference between symbol and substance. What was the symbol and what was the substance? In other words, the difference between the thing that represented something and that thing that was being represented. His conduct was not merely a blind response to law, but rather a living embodiment of the law. In other words, if they watched his conduct carefully, they would have learned what perfect obedience to the law really looked like. For example, healing on the Sabbath, they said, was work and sinful, but he showed that it was God's work to give peace to those who suffered, especially on the Sabbath, the day of peace and the day of rest. So there's four attacks. I mean, those are not the only ones. You go through the Gospels, boy, it's one attack after another. It never ends. You know, the devil attacks him and the, 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 the clergymen or the, you know, the religious people, they attack him. The crowd attacks him. The Romans attacked him. Everybody attacked him. But I just picked these four here to show you uh, some of the things that he, he had to put up with in his very short ministry. And so in their attempts to discredit Jesus and his disciples, the Jews searched to show him as being without authority. They tried to uh, accuse him of being unclean and, and common. They said that he was lacking in spiritual zeal and dedication. And they also said that he was basically disobedient to the law and sinful. Imagine saying that about the Son of God. Now Jesus didn't complain. There's nowhere in the Bible where he's with his disciples and you know, they're sitting around at his house after all of this and, and Jesus is saying, man, are those guys, you know, they're tough, I'm tired, I'm fed up with those people attacking me and because it's just not fair, you know, the way it goes, I'm the Son of God and those people are just not fair. You don't see any of that, do you? He didn't complain. He didn't defend himself. What he did was he managed to turn the tables on his enemies by revealing his divine authority based on his divine power. He showed them his great compassion for sinners. He wasn't a sinner. He was compassion towards sinners. He showed them his ultimate commitment in sacrificing himself. They said, you're not really dedicated. And then he died on the cross for them. And then he showed his righteousness by living according to the true spirit of the law and not just the letter of the law. 
and the net result of their attacks was that he was recognized and declared to be the Son of God. In the end, they came to know who he was by how he was. The name of the sermon. They knew who he was by how he was. Well, many centuries later, 21 actually, we are witnesses of these attacks. We read about them, discuss them. And we see how Jesus used the attacks of others on Himself to reveal His true personality. And 21 centuries later, we learn some important lessons that serve us in our struggle with attacks against us, because we too are attacked, not only by Satan, but by people in the world as well, because of our faith, because of the way we live. And so we need to learn, first of all, that attacks against faith will always continue. Please, let's not be surprised. There was one young woman that, um, I'll talk about the Tulsa experience. A lot of people asked us about the, what happened in Tulsa. There were a lot of people and so many things happened there that you know, uh, next Sunday I'll talk to you about that and we'll show some pictures too that we took at the, at the workshop. But I remember one young woman that came to me that just stood out. And she just came, she looked at the, you know, our, our display and she was very happy to find you know, some you know, video Bible teaching material because she worked with, in prison ministry. She worked with women who were in prison and said she didn't have any type of material to bring into the jail and to show on TV or leave with them and so on and so forth. So for her this was perfect material and it was free so it didn't get any better than that. But then we started to talk and, 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 I, and I could see in her, you know when you talk to somebody, I could just see that she was in pain, this poor young woman, about 30, uh, 30 years old roughly in her 30s. She worked with women who you know, were drug addicts and who were thieves and who did all kinds of things and you could tell she was really devoted to this work. But she was also discouraged. And she said to me, we're losing, aren't we? Because state after state after state are declaring you know, gay marriage is legal and headline after headline after headline are showing that evil people with evil motives and godless thinking are getting into top positions and dictating how we ought to live in this country. And she just said it just like that. You know, it's like as if her, her, all her angst and pain just came out in that one sentence. And she said, we're losing, aren't we? And I said, what makes you think we're losing? We're not losing. We're losing if you count the way the world counts. If losing means you know, the ones with the biggest numbers are the winners, well then the winners are the communist Chinese because they have the biggest numbers. I said to her, we're not losing, my dear sister, because God isn't judging us based on how the world counts. God is judging us based on how faithful we are. That's the name of the game, faithfulness. And it doesn't matter if your church has got five or 500 or two. When He comes, He's not going to look for size or how spectacular you are or how many numbers you had and how many people listened to you. When God comes, He only wants to know one thing. He only wants to know were you faithful? Were you faithful? Did you just remain faithful to me no matter what? And so the talk about DVDs and TV and media that just all went away, for me anyways, because we gave away thousands of DVDs, I'm saying thousands, and we really worked hard and it was very gratifying. But in a sense, I feel that you know, Bobby and Hal, they, they could have carried that ship by themselves. They didn't need me to do that. They were doing a great job. But in my own spirit, I felt God had sent me just for that one girl. Because this faithful sister, hardworking sister, in her soul, she was quitting. And when she walked away, she said, I'm so glad that we talked because you're right, we're not losing, and I'm not going to lose. 
because I continue to believe and I'm continuing to be faithful. And that's the message. We're always going to be attacked. It's always going to be there. Always. It, ne it will never stop. Never. Satan will continually try to create doubt in our minds about who Jesus really is. And if we doubt His divinity, we'll doubt His authority. If we doubt His authority, we'll doubt His ability to save us and bless us and judge us and we'll fall away. Because we won't follow someone who's not divine. But when you read the Gospels and see how He was, the healings and the miracles and the teachings and the conduct and the sacrifice and the resurrection, you'll remain convinced about who He was and how He still is. All I did with that young sister was point her back to Jesus. She had lost her focus. In remaining convinced about who He is, you will have confidence in what He can still do for you today. Even today, Jesus can forgive us. Even today, He can help us in this life. Even today, He can strengthen us to resist Satan's attacks. Even today, He gives us everlasting life. That promise is still there. And seeing how Jesus responded also helps us when we have to deal with the seduction that's in the world. Paul the Apostle warned Christians of the first century not to be conformed by the pressure or the seduction of this world, but to be transformed. You know that passage, Romans 12, 1 and 2. Every generation has to deal with the lure of modeling or molding their lives and lifestyle according to the patterns found in this world. I was speaking to my daughter this afternoon. Funny how things are. We live in the modern world. You know, we, we communicate with each other. I can talk to Julia and she can talk to me on Skype and I see her. What was only a dream when I was her age, I would not even imagine that on a little device you know, about this big, I could talk to somebody you know, a thousand miles away in real time. We could talk back and forth. Hey, say, say goodbye to grandpa. Say goodbye. We live in that world that couldn't be imagined 50 years ago. And yet she tells me, well, I don't know about you know, little Sophia. I don't know if I want to let her take the school bus because there's a little boy on that school bus and whenever those two are together, you know, it's bad chemistry. She comes home, she has a bad attitude, blah, 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 blah. And I'm thinking, nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. Lisa and I had the same worries about our children when they were little, I'm sure you did too. And if, if, if my mother was still alive today, I'm sure she could tell exactly the same story about me you know, with other certain friends of mine that were just a bad influence. And I, my mother used to get on my nerves because a kid would come in and I said, oh, this is my new friend Bobby. We just came in to get a little bit of water. Okay, blah, blah, blah. And then you know, he'd walk out and she'd say, I don't like him. Ma, you don't even know him. I mean, he just came, and that's all right. I don't like him. He, he can't come back here. <laughs> and you know what? <laughs> she was always right. <laughs> always right. She had a perfect record. She did like Lee's though. That was, that was a good thing. So what I'm saying here is that every generation has to deal with the lure of molding their lives according to the things that are in this in this world. We're, we're tempted to give up spiritual life for the momentary pleasure of various sins. We're encouraged to live for the moment and live for ourselves only and live without regard to the day when we will be judged. You know, Marty talked about heaven and hell. There is a judgment coming. It is given to man to die once and then comes what? The judgment. But Jesus provides the model that teaches us how to live, how to react to adversity, how to deal with the world without losing our souls and without losing our hope. Without losing our hope. We can learn to be who we were meant to be by molding our lives on the way that He lived His life. One of the reasons for His human life was to provide a model for our own life because the original model, Adam, could no longer provide the necessary example. So I encourage you to model your life after the one that Jesus lived. It's the life that never ends. It's the life that's filled with joy. 
It's the life that will ultimately have complete peace and ultimate power. And so if you want to begin that life, Jesus provides the example of obedience. Jesus, the very first thing He did in His public ministry was what? He went to John and He was baptized to fulfill all righteousness. If we want to begin the new life in Christ, the first, he, He's given us the example. We step into the waters of baptism when we step out a new disciple, a new creation. And if you want to return to that life, then Jesus provides the cross as an example of His love and His forgiveness for you. So the only question that comes, it begs right at the end, do people know who you are by how you are? Do people know who you are by how you are? They will if you live a life that is patterned by Jesus Christ in His work.